Good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining. Welcome to another live session at The Reactors. Before we get into the session, please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We're all here to learn, so please be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, and please be kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat will be open throughout and we do encourage you all to participate. Today we have a very exciting session, uh, which is getting excited to learn about AI and ML. This session is the opening ceremony for the machine learning and deep learning show ML DLS Summer School 2022. The speakers, um, we, we also have obviously a very exciting line of speakers. We have Carlota and Dimitri, who are Microsoft Cloud Advocates. And we also have Vedant, Harsh and Pratamesh, who are Microsoft Student Ambassadors. And with that, I'm now going to hand over to Vedant, who is going to lead the session with other speakers. Hi, Vedant. Hi, thanks Ra, for calling me in. And I'm very excited to no this problem. Part. Over to you now, and I will be in the background if you need me. Just shout my name. All the best. That's good. Thank you. So, hi everyone. I am Vedant, as Raf told. I'm a gold Microsoft Learn Student Ambassador. I'm very excited for this one, opening session of Machine Learning and Deep Learning Show 2022. So, first of all, let me tell you about MLDLS. Can I have a like, please? And also call Harsh and Prathamesh. Uh, my associates here on the stream. So Harsh, why don't you tell us about MLDLS, what we have been doing and what it's all about? Sure, Vedant. Hello, everybody. So I am Harsh Haran, and I am a Gold Microsoft Student Ambassador. So MLDLS is basically a two to three week long summer school which focuses on teaching machine learning in a very fun concept and a very understandable concept, right from the scratch to pretty advanced concepts. We, we give students lectures, assignments, and demos to help them understand machine learning and make it fun, right from the scratch to the point where they can make their own projects. And then we'll have the project showcase at the end. So this entire program, this entire summer school has been going on for the past three years. And we select a batch of 30 students who go on to become uh, proper machine learning enthusiasts and developers ahead. Vidant, why don't you introduce the uh, the format of the ML list and how we'll proceed? Yes. So the most important point here, which a lot of people ask about, is why only thirty students? And that is because it's it's a unique program where we give assignments uh, and we give individual feedback on your assignments because a lot of content which is available on machine learning. But then we want to make it interactive and deliver it in a way where students are really benefited out of it and they learn it from scratch till end and they can do projects on it. And that's why it's just 30 students. But selecting those 30 students is not based on your knowledge rather than it's based on your passion. So the application you can apply at ml.github.io and the application consists of some questions which are there to judge your passion for learning, passion for sharing, and passion for machine learning. And if you got one, then you're welcome to have a DLS. Can I have the next slides? So with ML, ML DLS, this time it's the third version, the third year we are having it. Uh, we had it in 2020, we had it in 2021. And one of the culture that we follow is that the attendee of the school joins us as co-organizer in the subsequent year. So we had Rucha, who was attending in 2020, who joined us as co-organizer in 2021. We had Tamesh, who was an attending in 2021, who joined us this year in 2022 as one of the co-organizers. So let's hear from Tamesh about his experience with MLDLS. Uh, thank you so much, Vedant. And Hi everyone, I am Pratamesh Shanbag. I am also a Microsoft Learn Student Ambassador like Harshan Vedant. And yes, I am also a graduate from the class of 2021, the machine learning and deep learning show. Uh, talking about my experience as someone who didn't know anything about machine learning uh, and I applied to this program and joined in. When I heard that they select only 30 students, I was pretty nervous, but 
uh they only they also look at how passionate you are about learning from this uh, platform and which is why i was very uh curious and wanted to learn more and apply to this program and to my surprise i had been selected uh talking about the entire experience of how the program is uh it is something that i have documented uh on my social media pages and you can definitely check it out if you want to have a look but if i tell you in brief about how it was um absolutely amazing i it the lectures were only on weekends so it was something that i used to look forward to uh, but they did not uh, keep me like idle they i had something to do uh, towards the weekdays uh, be it assignments or small projects it was always engaging and it made me fall in love with machine learning and therefore i would recommend anyone who is on the edge about this decision whether they should apply or not definitely go for it no second thoughts there right thank you prathamesh so another thing about mld list especially this year is that we collaborated with Microsoft Cloud Advocates to make it more interesting, more fun, and we have two of them here on this call today for this session, Carlota and Dimitri, who really supported us growing this community, growing MLDLS, and they'll be delivering an ins insightful session about machine learning today. So I'm really excited for the month. Let's hear from them, and over to you, Carlota and Dimitri. Thank you, thank you guys for uh, introducing us and for sharing this great opportunity uh, that uh, everyone can, uh, can apply for. Um, so uh, today, for this opening ceremony, we would like to guide you in a in a quick journey into AI, just to get you excited on learn more. Uh, and we have been talking for just a few minutes, and you might have noticed that we already used quite a few terms belonging to the area of artificial intelligence. We mentioned, it, for example, machine learning, data science, deep learning. So there's so much different terminology in the area of artificial intelligence, and so much learning material on the web that the learner can feel like an explorer in an uncharted territory. So if you're feeling like this, it's totally fine. We, we feel you. And that's indeed from this feeling that came out the idea of this session, along with the belief that artificial intelligence is dramatically changing and impacting our lives and our society. And it will do it more in the future. So you cannot definitely be out of this change. And not to mention, of course, how much fascinating this subject is. Right, Dimitri? Yes, definitely. So uh, this session, we wanted to give a quick introduction to uh, the area of AI. And for those of you who would be lucky to get accepted to the school, you will definitely hear a lot more about all the concepts. And those of you who do not make it or who do not have time to apply uh, for the school and who want to learn for themselves, we have some materials ready for you. Uh, quite recently at Microsoft Build, we have released uh, AI for Beginners curriculum which is open source curriculum on artificial intelligence available on GitHub. It's available uh, for students as well as for uh, teachers. Teachers can use it in their university courses. And for you, for, for students uh, uh, like you, it's definitely a great uh, place to start uh, learning AI. It's a text-based curriculum uh, containing 24 uh, lessons on different aspects of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, different types of neural networks. And that's uh, a great place to go if for some reason uh, uh, you do not get accepted to the school or you want to uh, learn a little bit more about that. So today our goal is to get you excited, to get you uh, interested and uh, go and learn more. And uh, that would be a quick journey. We will show you a few demonstrations uh, so that you can really appreciate what AI can do. And I think we are ready to start our journey, right? Sure, sure, let's start. Uh, so since we are starting a journey, as you just said, uh, first thing first, we need a map, right? And secondly, we need a destination. So our trip will count four stops across the globe, and for each stop, we'll be doing a short demo to put into practice some theoretical concept and also to showcase some of the capabilities of machine learning models and algorithms. So um, let's start by crossing a random forest and stopping in Antarctica. Uh, but why Antarctica? You uh, because we are going to deal with the following task. Classify a group of penguins with corresponding species. So classification is one of the most common techniques of what we usually call classical machine learning. And in particular, 
we are talking about supervised machine learning, so a technique able to learn a predictive function from a data set containing known labels, where a label is the category we want to predict, in this case the penguin species, along with predictive features, in this case physical characteristics of the penguins. This function can then be applied to unknown data to predict the labels given the features. There are two types of classification problem, binary classification and multi-class classification. A binary classification answers to a yes-no type of question like, does this penguin belong to the Adelaide family? Uh, while a multi-class classification answers to a more complex type of questions where more than one answer or more than one category, uh, if possible, as an answer. Like, to which family does these penguins belong to? Uh, there are a wide variety of classification algorithms and tree-based algorithms uh, are among the most common ones and probably also the best ones to start with, since the way they work is very intuitive. Uh, in fact, decision trees take a step-by-step -step approach to predict a variable. This type of algorithm starts with all of the data at a root node called the root of the tree and scans all the variables for the best one to split on. Uh, while random forest belongs to a more complex category of algorithms called ensemble algorithms, and they work by combining multiple base estimators to produce an optimal model. In the case of random forest, it applies an averaging function to multiple decision trees models for a better overall model that could be more efficient with more complex problem and more large data, data set. Well, now let's make our hands a bit dirty and dig into some R code. R is one of the most popular programming languages for data scientists, thanks to its intuitive syntax and the extensive set of functionalities provided for performing statistical modeling, machine learning, and data visualization. So let's start with our first demo. I can share my screen if you prefer. Okay. On exercise measurements for free penguin species that were observed in Antarctica. In our so the first step of our adventure will be to build the multi-class classifier using three based algorithms in order to separate penguins into categories of species. For this demo, we'll be using an R notebook in a GitHub called Spaces environment and the Palmer penguins data, which contains size measurements for free penguin species that were observed in Antarctica. In R, the Palmer penguins package provides the data that's related to these adorable creatures. So first thing first, Let's load this package together with the other packages from the tidy models collection required throughout the demo. Then let's have a quick overview of the data we are going to use. This dataset contains different information around the penguins. We have the name of the species, uh, which is also the label we want to predict. We have three species, Adelie, Chinstrap, and Gentoo. We have the name of the island, the bill length, the depth of the penguin bill, the length of the penguin flipper, the measure of the body mass, the sex, and the, and the year of study. But for sake of simplicity, let's consider only the physical characteristics of the penguins as feature predictors. So let's select bill length, bill depth, flipper length, and body, mass, and body mass columns, along with the species column that we want to predict from our data set. Before using this data to train our model, let's perform some preprocessing in order to discard rows that contain no feature values at all, so not available values, since they won't be useful in training a model. Now that we have, built, we have dealt with the missing values, let's explore how the features relate to the label by creating some box charts. So let's zoom in the box plots. From, the, from these plots, we can observe that it, it looks like species Adelie and Chinstrap have similar data profiles for build depth, body mass, and flipper length, while Chinstrap tend to have longer bill length. On the contrary, Free Gen 2 tends to have fairly clearly differentiated features from the others, which should help us train a good classification model. But before training the model, we need to split the data set into two subsets, one for training uh, and one for validation. So we will put 70% of the data set into the training data set. Um, now let's start by training a decision tree model since we just talked about decision trees. So let's build a model specification for a decision tree and let's 
fit the model using the fit function. So by printing out the model, we can already see which decision have been taken at each step and in which order. But visualizing the tree using fancy R part can be more intuitive. So let's do that. Here we are. So um, as we previously observed, the Gento penguins have clearly differentiated features from the others. And in particular, for free per length less than 207, we do not have any example of Adelie or Chinstrap species in the dataset. While to distinguish between Adelie and Chinstrap, we need to rely on the bill length feature, since the two species have similar ranges of values for the other two features. Now, let's use the train decision tree model in order to predict the labels of the test data set and let's print out the first 10 results. In this way, we can have a first impression of how the model is performing, observing that in most cases the prediction is correct with a significant confidence score. Obviously, this is not the best way to evaluate the performances of a model. We'd rather rely, for example, on a confusion matrix, in particular heat map, the confusion matrix shows the intersection of predicted and actual label values for each class, and the darker squares indicate high number of cases. And hopefully, like in this case, you can see that they form a diagonal line that shows where the predicted and actual labels value are the same. In simpler terms, for example, these are 43 penguins that were labeled as Adelie species and were actually um, Adelie penguins. So the confusion matrix is helpful also because it gives rise to other metrics that can help you better evaluate the performance of a classification model. So let's go through some of them. The most common one, of course, is the accuracy, which is the proportion of labels that were predicted accurately, for example. But we also have the precision, which is the proportion of predictive positives that are actually positive, and the recall, which is the proportion of positive results out of the number of samples that were actually positive. These metrics are defined for binary classification problem, but for a multi-class classification problem like this one, they, become, they can be calculated for each class using a one versus stress approach and then macro averaging the results. We already obtained quite high results for evaluation metrics for this model, so we can already be quite satisfied of our classification. But let's perform a step forward by training a random forest model. As we mentioned before, a random forest is an ensemble algorithm which works by combining multiple decision trees to produce an optimal model. So let's specify the model we want to build, which is a random forest for a classification problem, and let's also create a recipe to add a preposing step designed to normalize the numeric predictor features. And let's bundle the two, so the model specification and the recipe, into a workflow object. Now that we have our workflow object, we can train a model by using the fit function again and test it on the test subset. So let's have a first look of the prediction results for the first 10 rows. Again, we can see that the model is able to successfully predict lots of labels with a high confidence score, but how we can know that this model is better than the previous one? We can visualize again our confusion matrix and observe how the number of correct prediction in the diagonal line is slightly greater than before. Or uh, we can, for example, appreciate the improvement by calculating the evaluation matrix again and observing how these numbers are slightly above the previous results. We could go ahead and compute other evaluation metrics or try to tune further our models or, or experimenting with different classification models. But we leave, it, we leave this over to you. This is another challenge. And for the scope of this demo, we will stop here. Thank you, Carlotta. I think that was really a great demo. And I especially liked uh, the part when you showed the decision tree. And I think that's the great thing about it is that you can actually see how machine learning models work. And many machine mo learning models are like that. They are interpretable. You can understand why they take certain decisions. And that's a huge advantage. Um, also, classical machine learning models, they work on structured data, like a table. Um, in this example, you've seen there are specific measurements. But what if we want to uh, classify penguins, for example, based on their photograph and not on their uh, not, not on the data about them? 
or uh, what if you want to classify penguins uh, and polar bears to so distinguish between those two uh, that's a slightly different story and that's uh, where deep learning comes in so deep learning uh, is based on the concept of neural networks neural networks they are uh, modeled around uh, our brain they are similar to uh, how human brain works and uh, uh, they contain a lot of neurons uh, and uh, when we train a neural network we adjust uh, the those neurons to take right decisions um, the difference between classical machine learning and deep learning is that deep learning can work on unstructured data. We can feed it with raw photographs, uh, for example, with raw text and uh, do classification. But uh, the, other, the, the other part is that, machine, uh, that, that classical AI models, neural networks, they are not really interpretable because each neuron uh, contains some parameters, some weights, and there are a lot of those neurons. And uh, it's not really very clear like why a certain decision is taken. So they are so-called uh, black box uh, models. So if you want to learn more classical machine learning, for classical machine learning, we have the separate machine learning for beginners curriculum. Uh, and for, for neural networks, we have AI for beginners curriculum, which I have already mentioned. And during the school, uh, you will uh, have a chance to learn um, both of those things. So let's now uh, uh, see how can computers distinguish between uh, a polar bear and the penguin and uh, to see that um, i think we need the next slide um, that uh, brings us to our next uh, destination we are coming from antarctica to arctica because that's where polar bears live so let's uh, try to understand uh, how computer can actually uh, classify pictures how a computer can say what's on the picture uh, how humans typically do that well we uh, look at the picture and we try to scan uh, for some specific elements so for polar bear we probably would be looking at pose uh, at uh, the face at eyes uh, those kind of special features uh, which we which are familiar to us and that is exactly how neural networks can do it. So uh, so-called convolutional neural networks, neural networks that deal with images, uh, they have certain window which goes across the image and tries to, uh, and looks for specific patterns. Um, as I mentioned, uh, neural networks contain neurons with weights. So those weights, they, uh, they look at the pixels and capture familiar patterns. And once we have those patterns, we apply on top of them machine learning classification model uh, and this classification model tells us whether it's a bear uh, or a penguin. Well, that's a slightly simplified version of uh, how convolutional neural networks work. Uh, in real life, uh, you know, the, 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 the features can be really, they can look very differently. Uh, and that's why uh, we cannot really say that, uh, a, for example, a paw of a polar bear looks exactly like this. So that's why uh, this pattern captioning uh, magic is it's hierarchical. So uh, first, at the lowest level, we have uh, very simple uh, patterns. And those very simple patterns, they uh, contain, for example, uh, strokes, horizontal strokes, vertical strokes, those kind of very simple things. Then on the next level, we see how those things come together to form uh, larger parts of the image. And then after several blocks of the hierarchy, we actually construct uh, like the whole image and the neural network understands that this is in fact uh, a polar bear when all pieces of the puzzle kind of come together. So now let's uh, try to see the demo, which will show us uh, in practice how you can use neural networks to classify images. And that would be my first demo. Suppose I just came back from my trip to North and South Pole and I have a bunch of photographs, which I want to classify into different uh, folders with bears, with penguins, and with cats, just because I happen to have, to have my cat with me as well. Let's see if we can do that easily with the help of AI. If you want to run this code after uh, this lecture, it's available at, the, at this GitHub repository. So you are definitely welcome to try it out yourself. We will use the framework called TensorFlow and it's simplified the API called Keras, which is one of the most popular frameworks nowadays. And if you want to learn more about it, we have the great TensorFlow learning path at Microsoft Learn, which you can use. So we'll start by loading this framework 
and then we will use the pre-trained network called VGG16, which can be easily loaded and keras just with one line of code like this. Then we will take all our images and we will uh, load them from our directory, convert them into the size 224 by 224 into batches of five images. That's how those images will look like. You can see that uh, those images are mixed images of bears, cats, and penguins. To run them through the network, we just need to call VGG predict. Well, before we need to call the preprocessing function, and then decode predictions allow us to print it, this in human readable form. And you can see this is the first image, hammer bird with a probability of 0 0.38, or it's sea lion with a probability of 0 0.21, and so on. We have top five predictions here for the first image and also for all other images. So, for example, for the cat, we have this Persian cat. Uh, or links or Egyptian cat, and neural network cannot really, really be sure which breed of cat it is because it can in fact distinguish between several different breeds of cats. You can also run the predictions through all our images and uh, see how they in fact easily classified can be easily classified into specific classes. Well, but how does that actually work? Let's try to uh, figure that out. We can print the structure of the VGG network by saying VGG.summary. And that's our typical pyramid architecture. It starts with the image, 224 by 224, with three color channels. And then uh, as we extract features, the spatial dimensions are being reduced by the factor of 2 up to 7 by 7. And the number of features is being increased each time up to 512 features. So at the end, we end up with uh, this representation of our image, which is converted into one a uh, feature vector of the size uh, of around 25,000 elements. So uh, that's how the network works. Uh, to make sense what happens inside the network, we can try to uh, visualize uh, that. So we will take one of the images from our data set, for example, this beautiful cat, and uh, I will try to see the activations from the first block after the first convolution, so the after first application of filters, then from the middle of the network, and then final uh, convolutional block just before the classifier. So we can um, run this function to visualize that. And that's what, that's what happens. This is the after applying filters, the first layer of filters. You can see that some filters, they just do not pass any information through. But some of them highlight different parts of the image. So for example, this one highlights uh, cat's eyes. And also, it happens to highlight the background. And then uh also like some of them highlights the fur more and so on the next level uh this is not the next but uh in the middle of the network uh it's much more difficult to make sense of what goes on you can see that still the cat silhouette is visible and there are uh like quite a few filters which uh, actually filter out eyes and again there are some which filter out fur and there are many more filters which just do not fire those white boxes means that uh activation is very low and finally, just before the classifier, uh, there are only some of the filters, uh, which indeed focus on the important parts of a cat. And those filters, this pattern of those filters, in fact, shows that this is a cat and not a penguin. For the penguin, the pattern would be uh, different. And the final classifier picks that up. So what we can also do, we can try to uh, see how the ideal cat looks like. So here we start with a random noise image, and we want to target for example, say I miss cat. We are saying I want to display image which makes the neural network think that this is say I miss cat. And we minimize uh, the difference. So that's how it looks like in the beginning, very similar to random noise. And as this process goes on, we use gradient descent optimization, in fact, to find the image which would make the network uh, recognize a cat. You can see that this becomes uh, more and more similar not exactly to a cat but you can see some cat elements here you can see some of the eyes you can see some of the uh, shapes which resemble a cat and they are assembled in quite a random fashion but that's exactly what neural network looks for for those patterns and when it sees those patterns uh, it, it it gives us the result that it's a cat so here you can see an ear of a cat and many many eyes so as we've seen, the top layers of the network, they extract features from the image. And we can, in fact, uh, try to convert all images to feature vectors. In this case, we load the network without the top classifier. And we can run uh, this network on all our images. 
ending up with this uh, huge vector of uh, 85 is the number of images by 25,000 number of features. And those are different classes. Uh, so how can we actually make sure that closed vectors corresponds to, uh, to, to images uh, of the same class and images which are similar to each other? Well, to visualize that, we need to reduce the dimensions from 25,000 to something smaller, for example, to just two dimensions. For that, we can use a technique called principal component analysis from machine learning. And by reducing this to just the vector of two features, we can indeed see that uh, different classes of images correspond to different clusters of dots. And for example, uh, we can easily plot uh, the image corresponding to leftmost and rightmost dot here. You can see this is the ideal bear and this is the ideal cat. And it would be also interesting to see how those images look if we, for example, take the closer pixels and go from uh, left to right, for example, along the X axis. So we can do that. We can sort everything along the X axis and then display those images. And that's what we will get. Uh, I skip every fifth image um, to make it more uh, more understandable. But you can see that uh, images which correspond to pixels that are close to each other, they are visually similar. And that makes uh, feature vectors useful when we want to uh, look for similar images. That's how image search roughly looks like. Or if you want to group similar images together. If you want to learn more about computer vision in general, there is a great uh, computer vision learning path with TensorFlow on Microsoft Learn uh, or a for Beginners curriculum, which we'll mention at the end. Now, in terms of running this code, you may be thinking that uh, I was running it on my own computer, which is a Windows machine, as you can see from this taskbar. But in fact, that is not the case. Let me open the terminal and you will see that it is in fact a Linux machine. It is uh, Ubuntu. It's a data science virtual machine, which I have created in the cloud, uh, which has the GPU. And that's why everything was so fast. Uh, I can easily connect to that machine and I can edit all the code in Visual Studio Code, which is probably the most convenient way to do it. But for some reason, if you want to use data science virtual machine from the browser, you can also do that. You can uh, use Jupyter Hub environment and connect to that data science virtual machine uh, to the same notebook, which will look uh, very similar to Visual Studio Code, and you can execute the code in this way. But probably Visual Studio Code is the most convenient way for you to edit any code, whether it's local or in the cloud or in any data center. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you for this great demo. Uh, so we are now uh, at halfway of our journey. Good job so far. Um, and I think it's now time for a little break. Uh, we already covered quite a lot of content, traveling from Antarctica to Arctica, transitioning from classical machine learning to deep learning. So we would like now to propose you a pair of yoga exercises that, funny enough, have the same names um, of the adorable creatures we have dealt with so far. So take a few seconds to read instructions, get out of your chair and stretch a little bit. So for example, to do the beer pose, you can start on all fours with your hands and knees shoulder width apart. And from there, you can lift your hips up into the air so that your body forms an upside, an upside down V shape. While for the cat pose, you can come into a quadruped position and then as you exhale, round your spine up towards the ceiling. Okay, no, I was just kidding. Sorry for that. Uh, this is actually not a break, um, but more a spoiler for the next demo. Uh, can you believe that these instructions have not been written by a yoga teacher or a yoga lover? They have been written by a natural language um, processing model. So in particular, they have been written by OpenAI GP3 model that I would like to introduce to you. Uh, this is the third generation of OpenAI's generative pre-trained transformer model. And during the training process, it was fed with almost all the content existing over the internet at the time. And it's one of the largest neural network we are trained with 175 billion learning parameters. So the capabilities are very surprising. Uh, it is capable to write original poetry or to write an article from scratch or even to write code in a few coding languages. Also, a new Azure Cognitive Services called Azure OpenAI Service allows access to OpenAI's API to approved Microsoft customers in preview, combining the power of GPT-3 model to build in uh, enterprise-grade capabilities of Azure. Uh, but again, let's put into practice with our next demo.
So to prove to you that I'm not lying and that the yoga lessons instruction has not been written by a human yoga teacher, uh, in this demo, I will navigate to the OpenAI portal uh, in the playground environment provided for everyone who wants to test this model out. And I will show directly to you the answers of the model to my prompts. So for sake of simplicity in this demo, I'm not going to customize the NLP model I'm going to use, and I'm going to leave the default model suggested by uh, OpenAI which is the DaVinci one, the most capable model of GPT-3 series. Uh, however, be aware that you can choose uh, over there a different model, and you can also add domain-specific training data to your model, or you can even customize the result according to your needs. Uh, for example, you can specify a maximum length for your output, a stop sequence, or you can specify um, how many times a token can be repeated in the output, and so on. So the default task mode set for this mode, um, uh, for this model, sorry, is complete. Uh, that means that the model will try to guess how to complete the text given a start text injected. In this context, designing your prompt is essentially how you program the model, uh, usually by providing some instructions or a few examples. This is different from most other NLP services, which we, we could be familiar with, uh, designed for a single task, such as sentiment classification or named entity recognition. Instead, the completion, the completion endpoint can be used for virtually any task, including content or code gener gener generation, summarization, conversation, or creative writing. So let's start by asking to GPT-3 model to provide us with the instructions to follow to perform the yoga exercise. So let's try to type the following prompt. Uh, you are a uh, yoga teacher and you are going to describe to your learners how to do the beer pose. Great, we have our prompt. So let's submit this prompt and let's see uh, the, the answer of the model. Great, as you can see, the, the model is describing us, so it's giving us an instruction on how to do uh, the, the beer pose. So I let you read um, uh, this instruction on your own, uh, but you can see that the result is slightly different from the instructions in the slide deck, since the model generates every time different text. Uh, but the content, of course, is very similar. Uh, the description is well structured and it looks very natural, as it was written by a human yoga teacher. And if we try to resubmit the same prompt, asking the model to regenerate a new result, again, uh, a slightly different text will be pulled out uh, with a similar content, with similar instructions. Now, let's try to do a different kind of task. So let's use the last result as our prompt to ask the complete API to translate this text for us in Italian. So to do that, let's add here the instruction um, to ask for a translation. So translate <clears throat> the following text in Italian. Great. And let's submit this. Amazing, right? So it is translating uh, this small paragraph in Italian. And I'm sorry that only Italian speakers will be able to appreciate the quality of this translation, um, but uh, I'm Italian. I can assure to you that this translation is very accurate and well written. And of course, I encourage you to perform similar tests with the language you are good at, or to perform different tests, for example, changing the task, changing the engine, or changing the, the type of result you, you want to, uh, you want the model to um, pull out. So with this demo, not only uh, we learned about GPT-3 NLP model, but we also added a new stop in our map. We just landed to India, native country of the art of yoga. So you've seen that neural networks can deal with images, neural networks can deal with text, but uh, as human beings, we are capable of understanding both. And we are capable, for example, uh, to describe an image with words. 
Uh, neural networks can also do that. And those neural networks, they are called multimodal because they can handle uh, so-called different so-called modalities, images and text. Uh, one of the models uh, like that is called uh, Clip. Uh, it was also trained by OpenAI and it is released in the, um, like it's open, so you can use it in your projects. So what Clip does, Clip is short for contrastive uh, uh, pre-trained model. And uh, the way it works, it takes uh, a piece of text and an image and it tries to see how well the text corresponds to an image. Uh, so as you, you have already seen that we can convert uh, an image to a feature vector and the same can be done with text. So the network contains a text encoder and image encoder, uh, which encodes uh, both text and images into a vector. And then it tries to uh, build the metrics that shows uh, like which uh, parts of the image correspond, which images correspond to which prompts. So it's trained on the batch of uh, images and their descriptions. Uh, and it produces... Uh, like it can give you probability for each pair of uh, image and description, how well those two correspond. Uh, and uh, this can be used to do different uh, interesting tasks, uh, which we will see now uh, in the demo. Experimentation. We will start by installing the OpenAI Clip library from GitHub repository. And then uh, we can load the model with one easy uh, step, with one line of code. And you can see that we get both the model and the preprocessing function, which we can use to uh, preprocess images that we want to pass to the network. So how can we use Clip? One of the usages is so-called zero-shot image classification, where we can use this pre-trained network to classify images by matching them to different text prompts. For example, I will take one of the images from my dataset, this one, and I will try to match it to a prompt, a penguin, a bear, and a cat. So I'm passing three prompts to my network and one image, and as a result, I get a vector of probabilities. So you can see that this is a penguin with probability 0.001, a bear with probability 0.002, and a cat with a probability of 0.998, which means that an image probably is a cat. And you can use that with uh, many different images and the queries can be much more complicated because the network has seen a lot of uh, data. But this is not very exciting. We have seen that a uh, simple VGG network can do image classification pretty well. What you can also do, uh, you can do the opposite. You can start with um, one textual prompt and the number of images. So in this example, I will take all images from my dataset, all cat images from my dataset, and then try to match them to a prompt called SCMS cat. And I will get the image which most closely corresponds to this query. So this is a SCMS cat from my dataset. What I can also do, I can, for example, uh, change this prompt to a cat with big eyes. And this will give me a cat with big eyes. That is quite exciting because we can do a quite intelligent image search. Uh, however, we can also do uh, with Wikigen uh, and Clip, we can do image generation. Up to now, we have seen the networks which can uh, take images as an input and produce some kind of numeric output. But in this example, we will actually ask neural network to generate something new. So the way it works is uh, we use so-called generator. In this case, it's Wikigen, uh, which takes random vector as an input and produces an image as an output, an image which depends on this input vector. And then we ask Clip, does this image correspond to our prompt or not? So, for example, if we want to draw a boy with a penguin, we take the image and calculate the probability how well this image corresponds to the prompt. And then we can use this to adjust the input vector using gradient descent. And then we can generate something more close to the prompt. And repeating that many times, we end up with the image which corresponds to our text prompt. So I will not show you the code in detail because that is not very simple. Uh, I will use the library called Pixray, which is available on GitHub. And you can easily install it like here. Uh, and then to use the library, we pretty much specify the text prompt and some settings, like what image quality we want, uh, some custom losses. Do we want to pay more attention, for example, to saturation or to smoothness or to something else? And uh, which clips model do we want to use? So if we run this, and suppose I want to uh, generate an image of a cat that looks like a penguin. 
So uh, if you run this, you see that it loads uh, all the models. And it starts uh, with this uh, image, which is kind of uh, random noise. But if we wait a little bit, we will end up with something like this. And this is, I think, already quite impressive because you can see that this is really a creature, which is very innovative. It indeed, it looks like a little bit like a penguin and a little bit like a cat. Now, in terms of where I run this code, you can see that it is Asia Machine Learning Studio. So in fact, this was running in the browser. But if you want to edit it in Visual Studio Code, you just click the button here and you open the Visual Studio Code with exactly the same notebook and you can uh, do everything from VS Code. So that was quite impressive, wasn't it? Um, and here on the slide, there are a few more images generated using the same approach so that you can see that, for example, in the middle, a picture of a girl with robotic kitten uh, on the right, the portrait in impressionist style. Uh, you can ask neural networks to produce uh, pretty much many different things. And uh, the network, it is very powerful. It remembers many things. It remembers many things that it, it has seen, and it tries to uh, produce something similar to what it has seen before. But in general, that's a very interesting question. You can start asking, like, if a neural network can do something like that, I mean, uh, does it mean it is creative? Does not does it mean that uh, AI uh, has creativity? Does it mean that AI has some kind of personality that it wants to express? And that is an interesting question. You can think a little bit more about that. Um, um, on one hand, I mean, the results are impressive. On the other hand, the only thing we are doing, we are multiplying huge matrices. Neural networks are, in fact, matrix multiplication machines. And by, by doing this kind of simple math, we can produce uh, uh, those great results. Uh, that is quite impressive. And that, of course, uh, uh, First of all, it brings us to our final destination, to France, uh, kind of art capital of Europe, uh, if I can say so. And also it raises questions like if a neural network can do such powerful things, uh, like how powerful they are and uh, how should they be used? Yes, exactly, Dimitri. Thanks for rising up this because we are close to the end of this journey and we, we hope you clearly see that AI is based on a number of formal mathematical methods that allow us to extract patterns from data and train models to replicate human behaviors in some areas and also solve new problems. However, since, as you just said, we talked about very complex type of tasks and applications for AI, like generating original text or images, uh, this could sound very similar to a few science fiction movies where AI is represented as having some sort of emotions or able to make decisions unforeseen by its developers. Um, so it's worth mentioning that AI is a powerful tool and as, it, as every powerful tool, it can be used for good and bad purposes and what's important, it can be misused. So that's why we would like to wrap up with this quote from Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO, um, because this quote wants to explain why Microsoft stated important principles of responsible AI to avoid accidental misuse of, of it, including, for example, fairness or um, um, privacy, transparency, and more. So that was uh, just the beginning. We have shown you some great demos, and I have already seen in the chats that uh, you know some of you think they are impressive. That's really good. That means that we have achieved our goal. Um, there are a lot of places to learn in addition to uh, like machine learning uh, and data science school, which you should definitely try to get into. Um, there are also a lot of resources available uh, at Microsoft, uh, at Microsoft Learn. For example, for R, there is a separate module which you can explore uh, to do classical machine learning with R. Uh, for, do, for things related to computer vision, we have TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch um, modules. Uh, talking about neural networks and uh, computer vision. And uh, uh, yeah, the examples that we've shown you are also uh, available on GitHub, so you can play with them a little bit more. You can try to produce images that, uh, you know, like, that we haven't shown you, like the images that you can think about. And definitely explore the responsible AI. That's an endless, that's a really big uh, topic. Uh, and uh, it deserves like even a separate session. 
Great. So now I would like to ask Vedant maybe to tell us what are the next steps for um, machine learning and deep learning summer school. Thank you, Dimitri and Carlota, for that interesting session. I mean, I read a comment there, and uh, really the demos were very interesting. It's just some some of them I saw for the first time, and I myself have been working in learning for quite a while. Wants to explore it even more. Um, coming back to MLDLS, we again added another component to MLDLS this year, which is MLDLS Conference, which is happening on 25th soon. It will be a live stream event with lots of insightful sessions from academia, industry. We'll have lots of speakers joining in, even from student ambassadors. We'll have panel discussion, project showcase, and amazing networking opportunities. So make sure you register for the MLDLS Conference as well. There's a separate form other than Summer School. Which you can find on our website mldls.ksf.io to register for the MLLS conference and engage with the sessions. Over there. And again, uh, and again for MLDLS summer school, the form is still open. Find the information on the same website and hoping to see you soon. Um. Yes, thank you, uh, Vedant. And I would like also to share um, a last call to action for, for our attendees uh, because we have um, a Cloud Skills Challenge opening today. So we collected some Microsoft Learn modules that could be useful for, for your learning journey into AI. Some of them you already um, um, was in the in the deck uh, Dimitri was showing to you before. Uh, so take the challenge because you could also win uh, away some digital badges. So um, you can also use this handy QR code on the deck to directly join this challenge. So thank you everyone for joining this session. Thank you Dimitri. Thank you Vedant. Thank you Rav. Thank you all the machine learning deep learning. Uh, show team. Thank you, Carlotta. Should we, uh, like, since we have a few minutes, take uh, questions from the audience? Of course, of course. Why not? I think we have one question from Hilal. Uh, he asks how to make AI more like humans. What are the main challenges? Well, th this is a very, a very good question, I think, and probably uh, you can find some, or you, you found, or you can find some inspiration on what we just uh, saw today, because, um, I mean, generate um, uh, poetry or generate um, a yoga lesson or uh, a, 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 an original image, as you just so, uh, of course, is some something very similar to humans' behavior, right? The the most important thing is that we always um, recall um, responsible AI uh, principles and um, act uh, using, um, I mean, ethic principles. Uh, because as I just mentioned, it I think that AI is a very powerful tool. So. We, I mean, that the sciences have a, a, a lot of responsibilities in that. What's your, what are, what are your thoughts, Dimitri, on this interesting discussion? Yeah, definitely very interesting discussion. I think, uh, well, the, if you talk about the challenges, uh, of course, uh, the neural networks that we create now, uh, they are not exactly, they do not exactly replicate humans, and they can do a lot of things that we can do, but we still need to explore like how far they can go, because that's uh, still the issue of investigation. And uh, also, you should not be mistaken that even if AI can produce a picture like that, it doesn't mean that AI can be a, a, an artist. Because an artist is, he does much more than just, you know, producing an artifact. Because there is a whole lot of uh, things, like there is an idea behind the artifact, and uh, that is something, the idea and uh, the original, like, willingness to express something, to put uh, on some kind of uh, original idea, that's something a human being can do. Because we, as human beings, we have desire to do something. And uh, like neural networks, they don't have any desires. They are just matrix multiplication machines. And in this sense, uh, AI is really a great assistant to like, if you are writing a yoga book, you can probably ask AI for uh, some help, but you still would be, you know, doing like putting on the original idea, creating everything and uh, checking if it's accurate or not. Because AI has just seen a lot of examples, it tries to replicate what it has seen before. And AI would not exist without humans. I mean, it's not something that uh, 
you know, it's 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 essentially a technology which uh, tries to uh, mimic what it has seen before. In simple ways, like in classical machine learning, or in more complex ways, uh, like in those examples that we've shown you. But the principle is the same. It extracts patterns and tries to, to replicate them. I think we, we could go ahead for an entire session discussing about this, right? This <laughs> yeah, is very, we could have very started with this question and then talked for the whole hour. <laughs> so thank you for the question. So do okay, we have anything was... else from the chat? Just tuning in one thing. Uh, why are Shruta and Pratamish aware of your presence for the summer school and the conference? So if you have any question regarding that, you can reach out to us. Uh, find the contact detail on our website and register for this Cloud School Challenge. This one is, I mean, great thing, right? Um, sorry, we have one more question. Uh, I'm just going to pull it up on the screen. What are the career opportunities for AI and ML? Um, I think that a little bit depends on where in the world you are, but not too much because, I mean, this uh, topic, the, the area of AI and ML is really uh, growing very fast. So there are a lot of uh, opportunities in this space. But the only thing you should be prepared uh, is to learn, constantly learn, because that's not a field you can kind of learn in the university for five years and then start working and, uh, you know, not learning anything new. Because uh, as we speak, new models are being created. Um, and uh, you should always, like, be exploring new things. It's like lifelong learning, and you should be at the very edge to be competitive. So that's kind of uh, not an easy place to be but very exciting place to be because we're observing new things appear you know new exciting things appear every day yeah just to add to what you just said dimitri um, um th this is a field which is evolving every day so also in terms of for example university courses we see always evolving uh curricula and which is really great and this is very much related probably f with evolving um business and 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 job market um, so, yeah, and I, I mean, w today we just covered the scratch of, of this type of um, topics and discussions, uh, and I hope we give you some uh, useful resources to, to learn more and explore more. Yeah, what we have done in terms of uh, curriculum and university courses, what we've done in AI for Beginners curriculum, we have made a separate section called Extras, and we'll be putting like new exciting uh, lessons there because they, like the main curriculum is 24 lessons. But for example, this VQGAN plus clip uh, thing did not make it into the main part of the course because it's really, really quite new. Like it's less than, it's, it's around one year one year old, this this technique. And that's why like it, 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 it is the extra session. So we'll be expanding the curriculum sort of to be, um, uh, to be corresponding to state of the art in uh, AI. And uh, if you like this session, uh, definitely uh, also look for, we, we look forward for the conference, uh, which would be after the summer school. And uh, I encourage everyone to join the conference as well, because I'm sure it will be uh, like even more exciting than today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We were exciting to have you here with us today. Thank you, everyone, for joining the session. Goodbye.